Let me put you on game Don't listen to people who lose or you'll do the same Stop talking to people who don't give a f*** what you say Stop spending your money on weed, go hop on a plane Stop pointing the fingers Guys, welcome back, back, back to another episode of the Pursuit of Wealth Podcast Today is a special episode, we've got our very own Mr. Braden Johnson with us uh, Braden was our top producing agent of 2023 And surprisingly, he's only been in the industry for a year and a half Like, this year was your first full year in real estate And not even a year and a half, it's been a year in like three months so yeah, in like, like you started that. in October of 2022. Yeah. So uh, the numbers that you put up this year are crazy. And I want to get into that and share that with these guys because we try to bring on entrepreneurs, uh, high achieving salespeople like yourself to kind of talk to these guys about what it's like to be self-employed. Because that's you, even though you're on the team, you're still self-employed um, and what it's like to have to go out and grind in the sales world. So what did you, you've been in real estate for about a year and a half. What did you do before real estate? Uh, so before that, I barbered for about three years. Okay. Um, kind of went down a rabbit hole. I went and did summer sales. Okay. Because I was like, I don't know what to do. I just I want to get out of town. I was that typical high school kid. Yeah. It's like, screw Idaho Falls. I want to leave. Go big city? Where'd you yeah, go? Yeah, went to D.C. Uh, did, did summer sales, selling pest control. Did all right. The company I was with wasn't a good one, so I never got paid for it. Oh, snap. Came back. It's was like, what, what do I do with my life? Went and got a haircut, and I was like, I've always like, haircuts i've always skipped class in high school to go get haircuts and i was like we i think we can do this did numbers i was like yeah you can make money yeah went to barber school finished that went got my first job barbering didn't make jack nothing i remember that yeah i remember (laughs) cutting your hair being like dude this i must have done something wrong like you can't make what i thought you could well back yeah and like so (laughs) so man i'm still getting over this freaking cough had this for like two freaking weeks um so I remember going back to that, like when I, you were backstory, like you were my, you were my barber yeah. before you got licensed. And I started going to you like, I don't know, two years, it was probably two years before back, back. You were like, you were actually a past client of mine. We sold you guys your first house yeah, and then sold that house and helped you buy your second house. Yeah. I'd, I'd started barbering like a week before we started looking at houses. Okay. I remember that. And, and I would ask you, I'm like, dude, what are you like? You were only making 13. 15? Yeah, I was maybe making 13, 15 bucks an hour. At the first barbering job the, you had. Yeah, and like I couldn't, because I didn't have a clientele, I couldn't work. Yeah. I was like restricted because they didn't want to pay me hourly, but I was also trying to build. So like it was a double-edged sword of I couldn't make money. How long were you there? Ah, uh, I think six months. Okay, so you stuck it out there for six months. Yeah, six months. <clears throat> and then basically, like I said, I did the numbers and I was like, yeah, it, this ain't going to happen. I can't afford my house. I'm at the sell already. Yeah. Uh, So I reached out to another shop owner who was commissioned and it terrified me because I was like, man, I've done six months. I signed a document that I couldn't tell anybody I was leaving. Mm. So I was like, I'm restarting. Uh, First week made what I made the whole month. Wow. And I was like, okay, then the the numbers work out. So how does commission work in the barbering world versus like what you're doing hourly? So the way, I mean, essentially you could break it down to where I was commissioned at the other one. Okay. Basically I was 30, 70. Okay. I was taking 30 plus tips. Um, at this other place, the way that we did it was booth rent. Okay. So basically what it broke down to is about 10% of my monthly income mm. is what it was. Okay. Um, so, so it wasn't a fixed fee. It was a percentage of income that you could generate? Roughly, yeah. Okay. I mean, it was a fixed rate, but he kind of figured it based on what you do a month. Got it. So everybody's rent was different based on kind of what they were producing. Interesting. It, so across the board, it was 10%, but it was 10% of what you're making. Got it. If that yeah. makes sense. So, okay. Um, so yeah, basically a 10% fee. Um, so yeah, I did that. And I was like, okay. Did that two years at that shop. And then I went with you guys to Mexico. Yeah, I remember this. And I was sitting at the conference. and I feel like we got to give a little backstory on that too. So... Uh, we've been intertwined for a while. Um, yeah. he was my barber past client. We'd helped him buy and sell. His wife actually became our transaction coordinator, uh, during that time. So she was running our transactions. So she was, an, she was our, our first employee technically. Yeah. Kind of. Um, and so she did that. So when he's saying he went with us to Mexico, we, we took our team to Cabo for a real estate conference. And of course his wife came with us and they, she brought Braden. And uh, so that's why you're in Mexico with us. So they know. But yeah, tell, yeah. Can tell you. Yeah, so we're in Mexico and we're sitting at this conference. Everybody's cracked out. Like everyone's having the best time. Realtors yeah. get wild. Oh, yeah. And I was just like, man, this is sweet. Yeah. Something about this. Everybody has huge pockets. 
like, okay, I know you could, you could do good in real estate. And then some, I can't remember who it was. One of the older dudes who wore flip flops and like board shorts on the stage. Yeah. He said, when you're an entrepreneur, you pay twice by being on vacation. And like it drilled straight to my soul. It was like, he's like, you're paying by being here and you're paying to be here. And he's like, so you're paying twice because you're missing opportunity back at your job. And in my case, I couldn't make money unless I was cutting hair. Mm -hmm. And he's like, realtors, we're, we're writing deals on the beach. And I was like, okay, I got this. I got this backwards. I need to change something. (laughs) And we were writing deals on the beach. (laughs) You guys were. And that's when I was like, holy crap. Yeah. These guys are all working. I'm sitting here enjoying a vacation, which is fine because now I can't go enjoy a vacation. Like I'm working all the time. Yeah. But that's the trade-off I wanted is I can technically work anywhere. Yeah. And that's what drew me into it. Yeah, it it just, that's what itched me because sitting on the beach, I'm like, man, I feel like a loser next to all these guys. Like some of these dudes are making five, 10 grand while sitting here on the beach and I'm spending three, four grand to be here. And <laughs> yeah. I'm like, so this is backwards. No, and I, I like that you share that because it's such an inter- interesting perspective. Um, like you said, we we can make money from anywhere, but it's the trade-off is you're also, since you can work from every, every anywhere, you tend to work from everywhere. Yeah. So like if you go on vacation, you still answer your phone and you're still writing offers. You're still doing all that stuff, which I, I have learned to not really mind. Like I, I feel like that is the benefit. That's a trade off that I've already agreed to is, Hey, I want the flexibility to be able to travel, but with that flexibility comes responsibility while I'm traveling, which I think it's for a trade off versus the other side of it is, yeah, I can work a, a nine to five or like a more, uh, I can run a business that requires me to be in the office to make money. Um, and I can go on vacation. I have to worry about things, but like you said, I'm going to pay twice. I have to pay to be on the vacation. Then I also miss out on all the income I could have made if I was yeah. you know, in the office. So, yeah. Well, I think it's a balance. Cause like we've gone on a few vacations now, me and you mm-hmm. since being in this world, like Disneyland, for example, it's like knowing when and when not to respond to work yeah. was kind of the trick. Yep. There are obviously times that you're like, okay, I got it. I got to work. Yeah. And then there's times where it's like, yeah, I get back to you. Yeah. Like, I'll get back to you today. Like, one of them, the Disneyland was closing, and you guys were all at the gate, and I'm sitting there texting, and I'm <laughs> yeah. not walking because I'm trying to respond fast. And Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, there's a trade-off, but I wouldn't change it because it's just that peace of mind knowing, okay, I can still work while being here. Yeah. I Yeah, and I like it. You're right. There absolutely has to be the balance. Um, and your spouse has to know. Your spouse has to know about the fact that you can work while you're on vacation, they got to be somewhat okay with it because I know it can be frustrating the first few vacations, you know, we go on, it was like, I think at first Brie didn't really care. She's like, yeah. yeah Cause she was like in the grind too with me, yeah. but now she's kind of like, now she stepped back a little yeah, bit, turn off your phone for a little bit, like enjoy yeah. the vacation. Yeah. So, and I think it helped that Ashley was your guys TC. Yeah, she so knew she, it, mm-hmm. but I think on the transverse, she's, she's been out so long yeah. and now she's starting to forget. Yeah. And she's like, turn it off. I'm like, you know, I, yeah, I gotta, you do know, this. what's gotta happen. Like, <laughs> yeah. don't forget. <laughs> no, that's, and that's, that's a cool th- side is that she's, your spouse has been able to kind of already experience the chaos of real estate yeah. before you got into it. She was even trying to like not get me to do it. Yeah. Like, telling me all the worses of it. Yeah. While I was going through school, she's like, oh, they have to do this. They have to do that. You sure you want to do this? <laughs> and you sure you want it? I'm like, yeah, you just kind of get me excited. Yeah. Like I want it. Well, you're, you're a, you know, what I've noticed for me too, is like you, you're a busy body. And so like you like, you enjoy working yeah. um, and you want to be doing something, which s- most people aren't like that. You know, some people do want to just, it real estate wouldn't be for them because they wouldn't want to go out and work on a, on a Saturday or like uh, take a last, like a late night call and go out and show a house. But you're the type of person that you don't really enjoy just sitting on the couch. Yeah. No, it drives me nuts. <laughs> so, <clears throat> which I, is probably a good thing. Yeah. It's good. I mean, I, Everyone I've watched growing up, that's how they were. Yeah. Is there was no real like casual, yeah. casual days. So every time my wife says it's lazy Sunday, I'm like, no, that's not happening. Like <laughs> if, if we're not working, we're doing something. Yeah. Whether it's all of a sudden we're creating a chore or we're doing it. Yeah. I can't just sit there. Yeah. It drives me nuts. Even on vacation, like just sitting in a one spot drives me nuts. I'm yeah. Like, no, we got to go. Got to go explore, like, do yeah, something. Yeah. Like I don't know. I don't know why we're just sitting here. <laughs> yeah. No. So, I mean, and 
on, on like you've crushed it coming into sales like this first year and three months that you've been into it. Um, what was the initial transition like for you going from the barbershop to real estate? It was actually terrifying. Yeah. Cause I just had a kid. I just built a house, bought it with you guys. Yeah. Um, upgraded cars. Like I was living comfortably as a barber. Yeah. Made a decent salary. Yeah. Um, and then just full 180, just started all over. Yeah. So I was kind of terrified, but because of it, it was sink or swim. And it, we kind of had this plan of I was going to ease into barbering. And then you kind of called me after a month and you're like, bro, decide. Like, are you coming or not? Because uh, I need you. Yeah. And I was like, screw it. YOLO. I can always fall back, I guess, if I need to. Yeah. Just jumped in. I think that first October I did nine deals because it was, again, it was sink or swim. Yeah. Um, and I just started running. I was like, selling is not hard. You're just, I think barbering helped because all I did was talk to people. Yeah. I mean, you'd have a stranger sit in the chair and they'd immediately open up. And it was like, I was your counselor. I was your barber. I was your best friend. I was, I give you opinions you didn't care about. Yeah. Like, so just talking to people was easy. And I think having past sales experience was also helpful Yeah. to just run into it. But we're still learning at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, and, and like you said, you, you planned it out pretty well. Cause I know when, uh, you would always talk, like we would always talk about real estate when my, when I was getting my hair cut yeah. and you would always be like, Hey dude, what do you think about this cabin? What do you think about this rental property? And, uh, you know, I kept like, like you just need to get your license. Like you're looking at real estate all day, every day anyway, trying to work deals and figure out, you know, situations. And so I was like, you just need to get your license. But when you made that decision, you knew that, okay, if I get my real estate license, I'm going to go, uh, you know, full commission. I'm not going to have tax history. So if I want to make a transition in my housing, I better do it now or I'm going to have to wait two years. Yeah. And so then you're like, Hey, okay, we need to buy a new house. Let's get that done. And then once we close on the house, then I can decide if I want to go into real estate and do that thing. So you sold your house, bought the house that you wanted to be in for the next few years. Yeah. And uh, then you made the jump into real estate. And I think that's, it's just important that if you're going to do that, uh, like put some thought into it. You know, if you're going to plan to leave in, uh, your W2 or your job where you're comfortable and you have the tax history, um, think of, before you just jump, think about the next few years. Cause those are roadblocks that people run into and then they get into real estate and then they don't have the tax or income to show things. So then they don't get into real estate full time. So they can still have another side job to get that purchase if they need a car or a new house or whatever. So the fact that you plan this, I think helped a lot too of, Hey, we're selling our house. We're getting to this house. We're going to have a little bit of reserves. We plan to for you to have reserves on the sell of your house. Um, so that you weren't like up against the wall completely, right. but you're the type of person that even though you have a cushion, like you're going to put yourself, <clears throat> you're going to put yourself up against the wall anyway to yeah. try to push. So, which I think is a big part of your success. Um, going in, so like going into this year, this year is why I think what you did is so incredible this year. Um, you did, Oh, oh, nearly 10 million in volume, 31 or 32 transactions. Yeah. Um, in arguably one of the hardest markets we've seen in the last 10 years. Um, what, what do you think that you did differently? I mean, we've had 60,000 agents leave the industry this year because it was so tough. Um, but you, yet yeah, you had, I'm going to say the best year of your real estate career because it was the first year of your real estate career. But, uh, what do you think, what do you think attributed to that? I mean, that's hard because at, at the beginning, you know, I had title companies, they're all meeting me and they're like, it's a horrible time to do this. Like yeah. you, you quit your job to do this. And everybody kept telling me that. Yeah. But it was like studying what you were preaching, what I had been watching over the last year, diving into it and studying the market and where it was going. It was like, okay, yeah, it's going to be a down year. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like put your nose down and work. Yep. And like I've, like I said, I've seen so many people do that. Like my dad, for example, I've seen that dude dig out of a hole. And so I knew like as, as bad as the year can be, if I outwork everybody in the room, it doesn't matter because I'm going to get the deals that were there. They just didn't grab them. Yeah. So I, th the biggest thing was just kind of going numb this year. And I told the wife, I was like, this is the growing year. You're not going to see me a lot. It's going to suck. But like I have to do this because I just, I left this stable pay. Yeah. Like I've got to grind. And so it was that it was 
doing showings at nine, ten o'clock. It was up by five a.m. driving to Malta or Malad. It was putting forty thousand miles on the vehicle. Yeah, making calls, doing whatever, talking to anybody. You're just out working everybody. When yeah. everyone was going home at two, I'm sitting there like, what else? What else? Who else do I need to call? What else do I need to do? I think that attribute a lot of it. It's just out working people. Yeah. I, I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't agree more. We, I talk, I talk a lot about agents that, uh, there's a fine line between being part-time or being, uh, self-employed and unemployed. And a lot of agents just act like they're unemployed. Cause it's like, they don't have a showing schedule for that day or anything. Like they're not coming in to do lead gen. They're just going to like, oh, I don't have anything planned. So I'm going to go golf and, you know, maybe I'll grab lunch with my lender friend and I'll stop by the title company, say hi to my title friends. And it's like, that's all great. I am supportive of of having relationships in the real estate industry. But at the end of the day, like the lenders meeting with you or taking you to lunch because they want you to send them business. Right. They're not going to be sending you the business. No. So you need to spend your time networking with people that are actually going to send you business. And I think in our, a lot of agents get wrapped up in the real estate community. It's like 99% of the, like I've gotten referrals from some affiliates, lenders and title companies, but the majority of our business is not coming from those people. So like go surround yourself with people that are actually going to send you business, build relationships with other business owners, with other, you know, you build more relationships with your sphere of influence, um, do activities that are actually going to bring you business. And I think so many people just miss that. They want to get into real estate and they get dragged into the, like the fun world of real estate, which you talked about at the conference, like real estate, you know, get, can get wild. And we've always got parties and get togethers and open house things and, that you could attend, but at the end of the day, like that's not going to bring you business. No. It's going to bring you businesses, getting in the office, making your phone calls, following up with your leads, doing those kind of activities, which you've done really well. What, what was kind of like your schedule this year? Well, to start off like at the beginning was, I guess it was the end of 2022 when I came over, it was you and Chad. I was kind of watching you cause I knew, okay, I got to mimic what Anthony has done yeah, cause he obviously has done it. And you guys first were like, don't go to lunch with people. It's yeah. a waste of time. Yeah. So at the beginning, I was like, yeah, screw everybody. I'm not going to lunch. <laughs> yeah. Like, screw you guys. So I just did that. Um, the schedule, for the most part, what I try to do is I did it backwards from everybody else. Because we had in the office, it was like 9 to noon, do your stuff. Mm -hmm. I feel like that never worked for me. Because when I'm calling people, you're also at work. Yeah. You're probably not answering. So I kind of did it backwards as I was responding to people who text over the night or in the morning or they were reactive or interactive. Engaging, yeah. Yeah. So I would like <clears throat> message those people, but I wouldn't actually cold call until the evening when they got off work. So I'd go home and start doing calls mm -hmm. because that's when I felt like people were going to answer. They're getting off work. Yeah. I'm not bothering them during them because I had so many calls where they would answer. All right, I'm at work. See ya. And they click. And I'm like, this isn't working. Like. I can do this and I will have conversations, <coughs> but I also feel like if I wait until everyone else is off, I'll have more. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that helped. So in the office, it was interacting with those who are responding, sending a lot of emails, texts, new listings, seeing what's on the market. So my time blocking wasn't, wasn't consistent through the day until the evening. Yeah. And then that's really when I pounced. And then most of the time, you know, we're doing showings in the evening. Yeah. And so I was doing showings, coming home, kiss Ellie goodnight, and then I'm making calls. Yeah. And so it was like, I really was working until like 10, 11. I should be in bed by then. I'd finish, go to bed, wake up, do it again. Yeah. And that's, that's a lot of that's like just the hustle that people aren't willing to do. No. It's like they get into real estate and they're like, yeah, I worked from nine to noon and nothing really happened. So uh, looks like I'm just going to go home today. I think it's like, people got to learn to adapt. Yeah. Because, like, knocking doors, we'd start at noon. It was the worst time to knock doors. Yeah. I remember going to the guy who's the manager there, and I was like, dude, for a week, let me try not knocking till 5. I was like, I get it. I'm not knocking doors all day. But I was like, if I don't come home two a day after a full week, so 10 or 12, basically, all of Saturday, I was like, I'll go back to your schedule. The first night, I got seven deals. And I was like, bro. Like, cause I'm not gassed by the end of the day. Yeah. And so I immediately when this wasn't working, I was like, I'm going to just try the evening. It's the same thing. People yeah. are home. Now they're ready to listen. Yeah. 
and it worked for the most part. There were some nights I still got the same response. Don't yeah. don't talk to me, but it is what it is. Yeah. Well, and I think the hardest part for agents that you've done really well too is just like your follow up. Um, the thing I try to tell agents is like every time you interact with a client and you kind of know what they're looking for, you need to have that like backlog yeah. of like client, like, oh, I have that client that they said they wanted a three bed, you know, two bath. And uh, somebody just in the office mentioned they got a three bed, two bath coming up. Like maybe that'll work for them. Let me reach out. That's something I've noticed you've been really good at is every time we talk about, you know, pre listings in our team meetings. And everybody talks about like, oh, I've got this listing coming up and stuff. You're like, ah, I remember this guy I talked to like two months ago that came in. It wasn't ready yet, but he was interested in something like that. I'm going to reach out to him with this. And all of a sudden you're like, cool, now you just <clears throat> paired a deal that most people wouldn't have paired because they're just not remembering the conversations that they've had. They're not, maybe, maybe they're not noting it in their CRM and they're just forgetting, but you're really, you've been really good at remembering. Do you have some kind of system that you do for that? Or is it, do you like, is it noting it in your... It's- I'm, I should be better, especially for you guys on the CRM. Yeah. I'm noting it. Yeah. I call it the Barber Rolodex because there's so many people. I had so many different conversations. Mm. And it's like as soon as you sat in the chair, I had to remember what we've talked about. Yeah. And I feel like that's created this, we'll say, memory. Yeah. So, like, when things spark, I'm like, oh, I remember that person, that mm. person. I think it's just a lot to do with from barbering. Yeah. It's because I see people's names, and sometimes I wouldn't remember their face. I'm like, who is that? And then as soon as they sit down and I see their face, I'm like, oh, last time we talked about it, they just got a dog and they went hiking. Mm. And it's been six months since I've seen them. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, I don't know. I, I think barbering has a lot to do with that. That's such an important aspect, I think, of building a relationship is to remember conversations that you've had with somebody previously um, so that you can reflect on it. Like you said, like, oh yeah, they just bought a dog, you know, so you can follow up with, oh, how's the dog doing and all that. It's the same thing with real estate. You know, when you go to show them a house again, it's like, you better remember previous conversations you had if you hadn't shown them a house in a month or something, but to like be able to continue that relationship. But if you're asking them the same questions that you asked them the first showing, you're like, this dude doesn't remember anything. Yeah. Cause I've, I've been there when somebody forgets something they've already asked me and then they start out the conversation, ask me the same questions. And I answer them, but in my head, I'm thinking, dude, I've already freaking told you this. Yeah. So like, don't be that person, especially if you're in right. real estate. Right. I think it's so important. And if, and if you don't have that barber Rolodex mentality or, or memory, put it in your CRM. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to bag on you if you don't have the notes in the CRM. As long as you're remembering it, I don't care. But a lot of people just don't remember it. And so it's like, that's what the CRM is for. Like, put it into the CRM so that you can go back and reflect on it. Obviously, like our ISA team is... I mean, that's like killer Jordan's notes into the freaking CRM. Yeah. Dude's savage. It's like intense. It's like life story of everybody, but his job is to call. I mean, have hundreds of conversations. And so yeah. it's like, there's no way he's going to remember everything. He's got to note it. Um, so I think agents need to get good in that process. And I know you were really good at the beginning of what you took, what we said and you did it. It was like, here's a CRM. Here's the process. Here's how you set your, ta- like do your tasks. Here's how you set your tags and here's how you like organize it. And like from day one, you just did that. And like, as you're, I look at so many agents and they don't do it from the start and then they get three, 400 people in their database and it's so disorganized in their database. They don't even want to be in the CRM. Right. And it was like, I have an agent specifically that I'm like, you have 300 or 400 people in your database, but he didn't even want to be in his database because it was so disorganized that just caused stress. Right. And he didn't want to clean it up because it was going to take a lot of work to clean it up. So it was just like so many things fell through the cracks. And I'm like, I think it is so important from day one. And that's why I think you coming on at the time you did helped a ton because we really had our systems pretty dialed in and, and you were willing to do them. Like, that was I'm not going to blame your new CRM. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the old one. We're switching back to the old one. It was, it was the same thing. It was like, you're not going to go to a master and have them tell you something and be like, eh, you're dumb. Yeah. I'm going to do it my way. Like, it's the bread and butter. That's how you do it. Yeah. And so at the beginning, I was like, I'm just going to do it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But it worked. Yeah. So like, just keep doing it. <laughs> then we switched and I was like a lost chicken. Like, I had no idea what was happening. Yeah. yeah. But when we go back, like, it's, it's redialing in. It's a new year. It's going to be a big year. And it's going back to a lot of that. Yeah. And, I agree. Like it's going to be a, a big year in real estate. I think you're going to have a massive year. I mean, looking at what you did in 2023, 2024 is going to be a lot easier with where the market is going to be 
um, interest rate wise, buyer demand wise. Like we got agents on our team that already have, you know, that got multiple offers on their listings recently. Mm -hmm. Um, We're starting to get back into that market, which I know for a lot of agents, like they're terrified because they didn't do well in that market anyway. Um, But I'm like, it excites me. It, It excites me not because I like the craziness of, you know, 2020, 2021. I didn't love the craziness of that, but it, it was exciting to see the buyers that could actually afford a home. It's been really discouraging the last year, not because people don't want to buy a home, but they just, just couldn't. Yeah. 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 And it's like, I want to get back to the excitement of, you know, people, the average person being able to go in and actually afford a home. Um, it, and it's going to be tough because I think if people miss this boat over the next few months of interest rates coming down, getting into a home, even with interest rates coming down, home prices are going to go up. Yeah. And then they're going to be in the same situation where they still just can't afford a home. Yeah. I hope we hit a low of like, they're not with each other. Yeah. Hope rates come down. Prices stay. For and then when bit. they shoot, like <laughs> yeah. we, we hit that gap. Yeah. But yeah, it's, I think the same thing I've told even my brother, I'm like, you need to start working. Yeah. He's like, this might be your chance yeah. to buy a house. I think about that a lot of where I, where I think the the market's going, obviously, because um, we're still buying properties. We're buying properties to renovate and fix and flip, and um, and you always you got to know where the market is when you're doing that stuff, where you think it's going. And I'm like, I don't see the residential side coming down. Um, I just with our inventory levels, with the amount of people that need housing, um, I think commercial is going to get hit really hard. I think multifamily is going to get hit really hard in certain areas where they overbuilt, like Austin, Texas, and those kind of areas. Our, our area, I think, is going to be pretty stable. I don't think we've really overbuilt. Um, I'm curious to see how the, like, 55 and older community goes over by, like, off of 49th. Yeah. Because it seems like that's a lot. We got a of couple. We got that one. I know. And we got the one off of by like Papa 17th. Tom's. Yeah, by Papa Tom's. Mm-hmm. It's like those are trying to pop up, which also means where are those homes at? Like, are they coming up for sale? Yeah, exa- <laughs> that's true. It's like who's going to transition into those? I mean, they could pass them down, but yeah. I also hope we start to see some. Some inventory, yeah, in some, that lower price range. Some, yeah, pre-existing inventory coming up that would be super nice. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people are leaning towards new construction because new construction has, I mean, good deals. Rockwell's right now are at three sixty, at three fifty, three sixty. You can get, you know, they're willing to negotiate a little bit so you can get them down and on you, price. You got immediate equity. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, you, and then you go in there and you finish a basement and you yeah. have your landscaping. Put it's in like, yard, yeah, yeah, things gonna be worth. I, I'm curious. We just got our house appraised because. I hadn't gotten PMI removed. I should have done that like two years ago, but um, we got it appraised. I'm curious to see what it comes back at. We should get it this week. Yeah, um, I bet you're in the fives. Yeah, well, I, we just sold Arcadia for five. It appraised for five, thirteen. Yeah, I bet you're up there. So we've got. I mean, that's so stupid for what you bought that thing yeah, for. <laughs> yeah. Ridiculous. It's uh, great wealth. Yeah, well, that's, and it's awesome. I, I, what I, that project was <clears> like. I mean, that's just part of the benefits of the team. It's like we took down that project. Jason, agent on our team, had a client that he needed a house for that had a weird situation with their cell. And I was like, cool, I'm I'm willing. If they want to buy this house, it's what they wanted. Um, I'm willing to let them live there for a month while we figure out their cell because they're running their cell through our team. So like one for the client perspective, it was a huge benefit to use the team because they found an like a, a property that they didn't have to really compete on. Um and also that we were able to be like flexible. Like most sellers aren't going to say, yeah, you can move in for a month and we'll wait for your house to sell and take care of this stuff that's going on with your sell. But since I have an inside look at it, I can say, yeah, I'm willing to take that risk. And, you know, for Jace, it's like, cool. Now he gets the sell and the buy side commissions on this. And it's like all, it's all an all around win. And I love that for the team. And that's why we try to do more of these flips is because if we can create some <coughs> like inventory is tight, but if we can create more inventory, for our clients that our team is working with, just an added benefit. We like we do so many off de- off market deals within the team of like, hey, I've got this listing and hey, we actually have this buyer, and they're like, yeah, we'd rather just not have to worry about showings and stuff. Let's just get it sold together. So I love. I mean, that was one of me and you's first deal. Yeah, it was the first month I was in. Yeah, that trailer. Yep. It's like it was off market. We both picked it up. We split it. Yep. I sold it to a client the very next day. We both regret that. Yeah, we should have kept that property. It was but. like, it was quick. Yeah. We found it. We knew we knew the buyer, yep. picked it up. Easy, easy as that. Yeah. 
I love those are those are the fun things that I want to do more of this year. Um, so I'm excited excited to continue to do that. I should have bought that other. We, uh, we'll get had, more this year. Yeah, we'll I, have, I have another. I have, there's opportunities where I'm just not quick enough, and Braden always gives me crap for it because he's just like, "Dude, are you gonna?" Make a decision already on that. I'm yeah, like, I mean, I had you three this year. <laughs> yeah, that I just didn't buy. Yeah, you ended up changing it last minute. Yeah. Hey, we came through on 13th Street. He, I feel like that's and, a big reason why I did well this year as well. Because I feel like there's a lot of agents that when it gets hard, like they just give up on the deal. Uh-huh. Like they're just like, eh, it's torched. Yep. It's gone. I can't remember how many times I come to you or Devin or Jace brainstorming like what if i did this or this or that or that i probably saved a good half of those deals yeah when most agents probably just like yeah you're screwed sorry 100 percent. that's i i agree and that's one thing i think that's really attributed to your success is your determination to make a deal happen not and it's not forcing a deal but it's like what options do we have that if it doesn't work this conventional way is there still a way we can do this i mean we've worked again another it was one of my my listings, but we did a subject subject to deal on it, mm-hmm. which is like subject to the current financing, so that your buyer got a two point eight percent interest rate, yeah, and my sellers got out what they needed to get out. Um, we've also, you know, we've done you've done another like a wholesale deal, um, some creative you've done, yeah, you've done a bunch of different creative deals that most agents wouldn't know how to do it, and so they would just not get the transaction. Right. But luckily we have the resources and the knowledge to say, Hey, we can actually structure that this way, uh, to make it work for your clients. So, and I appreciate that about you though, though, the, the willingness to, this transaction might be hard, but I'm going to get it done anyway. Yeah. You know, it's not your cookie cutter conventional loan transaction. These buyers need a little extra help and I'm going to figure out a pathway for them to get to them where they need to be. Yeah, it's a good thing my HRV is like 93. <laughs> yeah. So I'm used to being stressed. <laughs> good that helped out a bunch. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there were so many deals, even like, and I knew certain deals, it was like, I have to make this happen because of down the road. Like, they'll refer me, they'll trust me, they'll know I made it happen. Mm-hmm. I remember I had a buddy, his his little sister. Ironically, him and his little sister buying a home at the same time. Yeah. Like three streets apart. As soon as we got the inspection, like the whole roof was trashed. And they're like, we can't do it. We had no room in the appraisal to up it. And I was like, screw it. I'll pay for the roof. Like, it'll come back. I mean, you guys referred me. I'm getting paid on the your brother buying. This one's a wash. But now all their family's helping or reach out to me to help. Their parents are looking with me. So it's like it paid off. And I feel like there's just a lot of agents who don't. They would have just been like, sir, your roof's screwed. Like, it is what it is. They're not, yeah. We've done deals, I mean, we've done deals like that as well, where it's like, it might be a wash on this deal. And it's like, yeah, we work for free on this deal. But what is that going to bring us in the future? And yeah. I think you have the mentality of this is a long-term career. This isn't a, I'm just doing a quick little sales gig while the market's hot or whatever, and then I'm going to get out. It's like, you're looking at this as, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to be doing real estate for the next 10, 20 years. Yeah. This last year wasn't hot. <laughs> yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. But with that long-term vision, like year, first year, first two years is always hard for every agent. Year three and four is where it really starts to get fun because you have two years of past clients that are now referring you business, repeat business. Um, and then you you just know what you're doing. You feel like you know what you're doing a lot more. And so you're, your three and four is like where it starts to get fun. So I'm excited for you having such a massive year, year one. I'm excited to see where you're at year three and four. Like, yeah, I hope, I hope you stick this out for the long haul. Every year I got a double. Double. Hey, got a double. If you do 60 deals this year, I think you can, which is actually even crazier is like, I think you'll do at least 50. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if I don't do 50, we're not going to bed. <laughs> we just got to keep going. Got that. You got that hustle. What a what advice would you give to a a newer agent getting into the real estate industry? I think the biggest thing is find a team, people that you trust, people that you know are doing it. Yeah. Because I think coming in with the mentality of oh, I'll do it alone, it's like yeah you could, but the amount of questions that I still have, it's like I'm coming to the top guys. Yeah. 
Like I'm still getting stumped or I'll hear something. I'm like, I've never heard of that. Mm-hmm. Or this pops up in a deal or this pops up. And it's like, you're not going to know how to get around that as a new time agent. Yeah. And then I think it's also seeing people who are successful around you, what they're doing. You start to pick up on those habits. And so that's the first thing is find a good team and just run with it. Of people and, that are actually selling homes. Yeah. Like, I think that's a key. I think there's so many people that try to recruit agents and you look, it's like, cool, recruit. But like, what is your production? Are yeah. you actually like selling homes? It's like, uh, you sold like 10 homes last year. Why are you were trying to recruit this new agent? You know? Yeah. I mean, if I outproduce you, I don't believe you. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm yeah. not listening. It's that law of credibility. Sorry. Yeah. Like you or Devin come tell me something. Yeah. I'll listen. Yeah. Jace. Eh, <laughs> you got some time on me, bro, but I outproduced you. So yeah. I'll listen to you, but we'll see if I follow it. And that's, I encourage agents to look for that. It's like, you want credibility. I've met with new agents recently and it's like, you know, they'll be talking to other teams or other uh, brokerages. And I'm like, well, who's, who's going to support you? Oh, I'm talking to this guy. And I'm like, what does he do? Well, he's actually a real estate coach. I'm like, so how does he plan to help you? Yeah. Like you can, I have a, I have a coach, a business coach, but like he, he helps me like on running my business, not how I'm going to go get like, like closings. Yeah. And if he hasn't been in the game for 10 years, so in houses, like things have changed. Right. He's going to tell you like, go cold call and knock on doors. And I'm like, there's better ways to be doing, you know, business. Not that, that you can't do it that way. You can do it that way. But it's like, he probably has no idea about content. He probably has no idea about like how to structure Zillow leads and realtor.com leads and all these other lead sources and Google PPC and Google my business marketing, all these other things that are going to generate business. And you're going to miss the boat in three years if you're not with a team that is adapting to the current market yeah. and providing opportunity within those spaces. Um, we're a big, I'm, I'm, like we're a big proponent of content and I've been pushing you to do more and more content. Yeah. So is this guy. Yeah. So is, so is Edgar, our content guy. Um, and, and I'm like, Edgar pushes me to do even more and more content. I feel like I'm doing okay. Yeah. Um, but I think we can all up it and that's, that's what we're trying to do this year. And that is a long-term play that people don't realize, but like being associated with that play over the next three years is going to be extremely beneficial because, uh, that stuff is like, it just compounds over time. Videos, content compounds over time. People can go back and look at it, especially once we just started posting on YouTube this year. Like I'm excited for what I think the team is going to look like in the next two, three years. Having, I'm excited to bring on more killers like yourself, like finding those agents that you're going to put their head down and grind. Um, Cause I know that I think you're going to be a, an agent that a lot of people look up to over the next two years. Like year one, here's what you did. Year two, if you can double it this year, like it's going to be, people are going to be like, what is, what are you doing? What a, from maybe like a, a business side or entrepreneurial side of it. What is like, what is probably the, the number one thing you didn't realize uh, before getting into the industry that you're going to have to do like a sacrifice that you're going to have to make or, you know, I think the reason I'm asking this is a lot of people get into real estate cause they're like, I want the flexible schedule. Um, I want to get into sales cause I don't want any cap on my income, which, which is great, but there are sacrifices you're going to have to make. Was there anything that you didn't realize maybe when you were first getting into it that you, I don't think so because Cutting your hair for three years, yeah. the wife being involved in it, having so many realtors who came into the shop. <clears throat> like, I think I knew most of what to expect. Yeah. Um, having ran my barber business, I knew business size. There's not a lot that was a surprise, I would think. Yeah. Because I also, like I told you, I, I told the wife, you're not going to see me a lot. Like, yeah. I knew time with them was going to be s- slim. I knew a lot of things were going to be tight. I think what people get misconception on the flexible schedule is it's not, it means when your kid has something going on, you can go to that and then come back. Yeah. And then you can meet your wife for lunch and come back and you can do this and come back. But it's not like I can work as I please. Yeah. It's more or less like, yeah, you can step away from work. Yeah. But you're always working. Like there's no real flexible schedule. Yeah. I think people get that messed up but yeah, there wasn't really any surprise i don't think this year that i was like well if i'd have known this i wouldn't have done it yeah i don't think i had any real shock 
Was there any? Was there anything you would have done differently this year? <clears throat> worked harder, for sure. In what I aspect? Mean, like I definitely worked hard. I worked long days, consistent days. But I think I only pushed about seventy five percent. Like if I actually broke down the time in the day, I really probably wasted like four hours a day. Yeah. And I I worked, you know, fourteen hour days. And to know that of that fourteen hours, I could have pushed four more hours of productive work mm. kind of pisses me off. <laughs> Knowing that I was at nine point two and I could have been at ten yeah. if I'd have pushed a few more days. And so that's one thing that I do regret from the last year's even though I felt I was working hard, not working people, yeah. I still don't think I maxed out. Yeah. Which you don't necessarily want to max out, so you burn out. But I definitely think I could have pushed harder. It was a healthy, there's a healthy balance because you could you could look at it as not even like if I had done four hours of productive work, then I could only have to work, you know, instead of working 14 hours, I only worked 10 hours. Right. Or like if you were working 10 hours and you did four more hours of work, like or four more hours of productive work, that maybe you work only like eight hours a day instead of the 12 hours. You know? Yeah, time management like, could have, that was the fault this year. It was yeah. time management. It's like that 14 hours probably could have been seven, eight if it was just like super productive. Balls to the wall for eight yeah. hours for sure. But I mean, there's so much that comes up and you get off track and you squirrel it and yeah, then you come back and then you go back and it is what it is. But that's, yeah. that's something I've really got to focus in this year. To hit that fifty, yeah, is like okay. These eight hours got to be killer. I I'm still fine doing fourteen hour days, but it'd be nice to do ten. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think uh, I think my like the goal for this year for everybody should be extreme focus. Yeah. Like The one thing I've realized is there's always opportunities that come up, and if I just focused on what's like my main priorities of like real estate and running the team and doing that stuff, like how much more beneficial those things would be in my life if I was just focused on them. And I think everybody's same like agents, if they just focused on one pillar of their business, like we kind of talked about at our team team retreat and didn't try to do everything at once, but just said, you know, Hey, this month or this quarter, I am just focused on doing like open houses and I'm going to do 50 open houses in the quarter. And that's like all I'm going to do versus yeah, I'm going to try an open house every once in a while. And then I might try like door hangers and then I might try, uh, doing a little bit of content and I might try this. It's like, well, now you're not doing anything good. You're right. just like trying everything, which isn't going to get you any results. But if you just focused on that one pillar, like I'm just going to do this for the next 90 days, I think, I think you'd be so much more successful in anything that you actually pursued. Um, and that's my, like, you know, I need to do that. And that's why I've been preaching it is because last year I tried to do all these different things, especially with content. Um, and even Edgar was like, you're doing like, you're going to do two things this year. Here's what you should focus on. Like, or wh whatever you want to focus on, but like only focus on these two. Cause you can't do everything. Um, right. because we're not going to be good at anything. <clears throat> and so I think for everybody on the team, it's that same aspect of find that one thing that you want to do for lead gen or whatever it is like to generate business focus on that right and like tune out everything else i think i did that last year it was like march to may it was like shotgun just do all of it yeah and then it was like june when i really hit a stride and i was like you know i'm just doing follow-up boss like whoever's in there that's what i'm touching i'm yeah. not doing any more of this bs yeah because i was like i can't commit to it either yeah. i did it or i didn't and i tried this and then i didn't do it the next and then when i really honed in on that it was like i took off yeah. Then we have that leaderboard out there and that low key <laughs> drove, drove me nuts. <laughs> and then when my wife responded to the message and is like, so and so's beating you, I was like, oh, it's game on. <laughs> I'm ne <laughs> never getting questioned again. Oh, I love that. It's, it's cool. I, I like the little competitive, like friendly competition we have within the office of we want everybody to win, but we also like, we want to beat everybody. Like, so. Yeah, I'm a huge proponent of the, if everyone's right behind you, you can only fall back so far. Yeah. Um, you said it actually, you said it when I first started, it was, if you're here and you bring everybody up with you, you're only going to fall to where that line is. Mm -hmm. If you leave everybody, you got a long way to fall. Yep. So yeah, it's like, I want everyone out there to kill it. Yeah. 
but you're not going to beat me. Yeah. You have to try hard. But I think it helps push you, you know, it, yeah. like it, you know, having the people that are also producing right alongside you, um, drives you to continue to produce. Because again, like you said it earlier, your environment is kind of what establishes that you growing up, you said you didn't see anybody that took lazy Sundays. It was like everybody that you knew your dad, <laughs> everybody else was, they were working, you know, it was like they were busy bodies. So you naturally took on that habit as well of like, if I'm not working, I need to be doing something. Um, it just shows that you, you are a product of your environment. Like if you're surrounded by a bunch of people that only produce five or 10 deals a year, you're going to think like, Oh, me producing five or 10 deals a year is good. Like I'm doing good. I'm doing what everybody else is doing. But like, if you're surrounded by people that are producing 20, 30 transactions, you're going to be like, I need to get there too. If I'm not like, what am I doing wrong? I need to do something different versus the other side of like thinking you don't need to do anything different because you're just right where everybody else is. Yeah. And so I'm such a big proponent of finding your environment of people that are going to help support your growth. Um, and I think you've, you've done that really well here with the team, even just leading that charge. Yeah. Well, I'm like, dude, in high school, I had it. I thought I had it rough compared to my little brother. Cause like, like I could not stand my dad cause I, he made me work for him. It was not like a, go find a job. It was like, you can drive, you're working. And it was like, I was going to work at 3 a.m. for him. He would deliver a load to Walmart because he owned a Little Debbie's route. Mm -hmm. He would deliver it, and then I'd have to go behind him and work the stores. I had to finish by 8 so I could get to school. So I'd be, I'm already five hours into the day before school starts. Wow. If I didn't finish, I had to go back. And then if he got a call during the day that I half-assed, I also had to go back. <laughs> so it was like I had to do it right, and most times I couldn't finish because I had four stores to do. So I'd get down to school, go to football, then I'd go back to work, and then I'd come home, not do any homework, because <laughs> I wanted to go to bed, because it was like midnight, Yeah, I had to be up at three, and I did that for four years, all through high school. Wow. And it was like, by the end of it, I was like, I hate you. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm beat as a teenager. Yeah. But now looking back, like my little brother didn't have to do that, the work ethic is uh, he, he still works hard. Yeah. He's decent because we both watched that man kill himself. But, like, there's a different level between me and him still. Like, he he's not willing to to push. Put in, Yeah, he didn't have that same uh, – he wasn't put in the same environment almost no. as you were. Yeah, my mom babied him a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> um, do you want to share any of your, your dad's story and, like, what that childhood was like? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so he was technically involved in one of those Ponzi schemes. Um, yeah, he, he got wrapped into. Yeah, he got wrapped into one of them. Um, I was like 07. We sold the house I grew up in. He bought a home. He was investing. People started questioning, like, this dude's never at work. How are they? I mean, we had toys. Like, we had brand new four wheelers. My dad bought a Duckworth boat, and in 07, that boat's worth 240. So now it's like 400 thousand dollar boat. Oh man. He bought a brand new truck. He bought my mom a Jaguar. We had four houses in that neighborhood. We had two cabins in Island Park. I mean, we're living life. Yeah. Well, yeah. How old were you at this point? Uh, I was seven. Okay. Like Christmas. I mean, they probably dropped 20 grand at Christmas that year. <laughs> like we just had all of it. Yeah. It was sick. <clears throat> People started investing into him. The guy at the very top, which the dude just got put in prison last year. For wow. It. Really? Yeah. They finally busted him. All of a sudden, he just disappears. And so my dad's disappears. I mean, the interest he was making per month on the money, he said at most consistently from the year that I was seven, so 2006, uh -huh. he was making 113 k a month just on his interest. So basically how it was is like your dad invested in this guy. He invested in this guy who was just purchasing real estate. And he was buying real estate. And the guy would send him interest money. Interest money, yeah. Month. And that's how he was living. So then other people saw what your dad was So they were giving him making, money. And they're like, hey, we want to invest in that with you. Yeah. So your dad was like, yeah, connected them to the yeah. head guy that was so running the So the money scheme. was running up the, up the line. My dad was working on getting his securities <clears throat> so that he could invest. And raise money and yeah, stuff. Yeah, raise your money and give it. Um, and he got it. Basically, the state had caught it before they issued it. So he got mm -hmm. his security license. So he could do this and they basically were like, yeah, we don't care. Like it's, so they took everything. He filed bankruptcy, all seven houses gone. Wow. 
Wow. All the cars repoed. I mean, I was at a school choir concert. Like I was singing it. I think it was third grade. We came out and the car was gone because it was towed. It was repoed Oof. because they were just taking everything. That was 2007? It was two, yeah, like early 2008, maybe end of 2007. Okay. And real estate market's crashing at this point. Like Oof. world's flopping. Yeah. And my dad knew it because he was calling. He's like, where's the money? And they're like, it's coming, blah, blah, blah. And his downline's like, where's our money? So people are trying to sue him. He's, so it, it was bad. We ended up moving with my grandparents. It took like three years there. We're basically paying rent living in the basement. We finally got into a Rockwell townhome, twin home. It was two bed, two bath for the f- family of four. Took him 10 years to get out of the debt that it put him in. Um, and that dude just worked like a dog. And I remember my junior year, homie was in the kitchen and he was just crying because he's like, I've worked all my way up and it feels like it's crashing again. And he was working like, I think it was 19 hour days doing this little Debbie job. And I legit went to school and filled out dropout papers because I was like, I got to go to work. Like we're going to lose everything again. Mom got pissed. She's like, yeah, you're not doing that. Yeah. Yeah, Like we'll figure this out. You don't have to figure this out. And I just remember, and then he made it through. They bought a house, live in life. But I just remember like that 15 years, like it, your world was like this and then it crashed and then it came up a little bit and then it crashed and that dude finally pulled through. And it was like, I think he lost like 70 pounds during that time. Like his health just deteriorated. But all he cared about was providing. Mm-hmm. Didn't buy a piece of clothing for 15 years for himself. Like, just cared about us, which is sad because at the time I was like, I hate this guy. Like, he's forcing me to work. Like, this is some bull. But now, looking back, it's like, okay, every kid needs to grow up like that. Like, you almost need to be rose, raised broke mm-hmm. so that you, I mean, dude, we'd go through the grocery store with a calculator because my mom would be like, okay, we got 100 bucks. And then we'd be calculating. You push clear on accident. You're like, oh, shit. We got to go back through the store. And then we'd be at the grocery store. And my mom would be like, oh, we went over. Uh, we're going without the cereal this week. I mean, it was like, it was rough. But seeing that, it's like, okay. It also gives me this fear, like, this isn't real life. And, like, the snap of a finger, I can lose it. Which is also why I think I outwork everybody. Yeah. Because I've seen it all get taken away. Mm -hmm. I remember my parents, like my mom would be crying because the car was repoed and we were at a school and now everybody can see that we lost our car. We lost the house. We're out of the neighborhood. Like she's driving us to school now in an 04 Ultima and she was driving a Jaguar before that. I mean, I'm glad we raised, we're raised poor after the fact, but at the time it was like, and I envied my parents because like, you guys suck. You took me away from friends the school, like my image looks bad now. I was worried about that at seven when my image looked like, <laughs> like <Yeah. clears throat> but yeah, now I have this, I just have this fear that I never want to do that. I never want to take Ellie to the grocery store and be like, here's a calculator. Like, that's not happening. I mean, I'll work seven jobs before I do that. I, uh, the reason I, the reason I wanted to share that is, um, you know, cause I, I know this, I know the story and, there, I think there's a there's a direct correlation between um, successful people and some level of uh, tr- trauma is a heavy word, but I'm gonna say trauma or ex- some level of experience that they that they've gone through that gives them that drive. Um, you look at like the most successful people in the world. You look at Elon Musk, and you you listen to his childhood and the way his dad was to him and all these things. And you see why he feels like he has a chip on his shoulder. He feels like he has a chip on his shoulder and he's like the richest man in the world. Right. And he still has a chip on his shoulder to try to prove something. Um, There's a, there's a balance there that I'm like, you almost need some level of, you had to have gone through something to develop that. Cause I look at people that, you know, did grow up really in a cush life. And some are successful, but most of them are just like, they don't really have the drive because they're just like, "Eh, I can, you know, they're actually, they tend to be the ones that end up being like kind of like the more hippie, 
uh, I'll live in a, like a little house and, um, you know, travel the world and do these kind of things because they don't care necessarily about material things. Cause they actually kind of like already got their material fix growing up versus people that grew up broke are super motivated to get money to, t- to have those nice things because they didn't have them when they were growing up. Um, and so I think it's, you know, everybody goes through different experiences in their life and you could have taken that and been like, I, you know, I don't ever want to do real estate that, you know, my dad got caught into some messed up scheme, you know, back in 2007 with that. Or you could have taken it as like, my dad worked too hard growing up and I never want to be like that. So I'm just going to go get a nine to five because, you know, I don't want to work 14 hour days or something. But you took it as like, I'm going to use this as a way for me to better myself and for me to leverage it as a pain point to make sure that I'm successful, you know? And (laughs) I think, uh, I think you're right. I think some people need to look at the things that they've experienced in life and see what they gather from them and try to use them for your benefit. You know, I, for me, you know, my dad, his big driver was, um, his mom passed away when he was three years old because they didn't have money to go to the doctor. She had the flu. Like they could have went to the doctor and probably gave her medication and saved her, but they had no insurance, no money. Like she died at home because she had the flu. And, um, that was his big driver that like he never wanted anybody in our family to, to die because we couldn't afford hospital care, the proper hospital care. Um, and so that was his big driver security. He just want to have security financially to be able to afford for that. Um, so everybody's got their different reasons. You know, you saying I never want to have to go to the grocery store and like calculate how much money we're spending on groceries. Um, that's a huge driver that's going to continue to make you successful. That fear. I have that fear of it all going away. Like I think most successful people have to have a fear or else they're going to lose their drive. So I think it's a cool story and I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Um, for those out there that, you know, might have similar (laughs) stories or, or have some way they can relate to that and try to use that for their benefit. Um, wrapping this up, what would be your one piece of advice for anybody looking to get into a, to a sales career? I think if you thought about doing it, do it because you'll never know. You won't regret it. Whatever the sales may be, make sure you join the right team. I think it's the number one thing. I think anybody who tries to do it solo, like if you don't have some sort of mentor or something who's guiding you through it, there's a good chance of failure. Yeah. Like you can, there's a, there's people who probably do it. Kudos to them. But at the end of the day, like why struggle if it's that much easier yeah. to have someone in your corner? Mm-hmm. So whether it's, I mean, door to door, real estate, cars, whatever the sales job is. Yeah. Just, Join the right squad. That's really it. Because that can also make the day fun. I mean, you're having a shit day. Everyone else hooting and hollering because they're killing it. It's kind of hard to be down because you come in and you get motivated. And you're like, okay, everyone else is doing it. I'm better than that guy. I know I can do it. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the biggest thing. Just put yourself in the right area. Love that. And uh, and it helps collapse time. Yeah. Getting to your level of production. You, pro- you know, Let's say you could have done it on your own and it might have taken you a four years, but you did it year one instead. And just imagine now what year two is going to look like. And now what year three and now like year four, you should, you're going to be 10 years ahead of where you could have been year four if you'd done the other route. And maybe things would have been different, but I'm just saying like, for example, that's the way I look at it is man, think of a lot of this stuff. You don't need to recreate the wheel. If somebody's already doing it and getting it, like how fast, could you get up to speed if you just kind of followed their game plan? That's what I look at people like investing in real estate. If I didn't have mentors investing in real estate, flipping homes, doing the things that are doing hard money loans, I would be scared to do. And I probably would never do it. And like now that that's like one of the things that I enjoy most about real estate is doing those deals and um, structuring flips and hard money loans. And um, so I, I, but I would have never known that if I hadn't gotten a mentor and joined for me, it was joining a mastermind group that I'm a part of that has helped. They're like my team that I can kick ideas off of and go to for that stuff. So I agree hundred percent, get with the right, get in the right environment and get with the right team. Yeah. And I always tell people like, you're that mentor for me. That's why I joined the team. Yeah. Cause I mean, 
the time that I bought the first house with you, the amount of wealth that you've gained me, like none of it would have been possible without you. Yeah. A lot of it, buying the homes, switching barber shops. I mean, you've influenced that one. Yeah. Switching into real estate, you influenced that one. When we make dumb purchases, <laughs> you make sure to call it out. Like a lot of it. I mean, I tell people like, if you tell me jump, I'm probably going to jump because yeah. you haven't told me wrong yet. So, yeah. And that's what people got to find. They got to find that mentor. That's cool. I have that. That fills my cup. Just even hearing that stuff. That's what I love to do. So appreciate you. Appreciate your hard work this year. I think there's a lot that people could learn from you. If you're a new agent or you're interested in getting in the real estate uh, industry, reach out to Braden. Braden Johnson Realtor. Uh, on Instagram? Yeah, something like that. Braden Johnson Realtor, I think on Instagram, you'll find him or Google him, Braden Johnson, Top Notch Real Estate. I'm not um, as scary as I look. It's not as scary. He's a nice guy. He's kind of got an RBF, but he is really nice. For sure. <laughs> Every guy in my family has it. But he he will give you tips. I mean, he crushed it first year, almost 10 million in volume, 31 transactions in one of the hardest years in real estate. Um, you guys can learn something from him. If you have questions on real estate, shoot him a message. He's an open book. He's willing to share. He wants to help others grow just like he's grown. So appreciate you coming on, man. Share your story. Thanks for having me. Until next time, we'll catch you guys later. Don't listen to people who lose or you'll do the same. Stop talking to people who don't give a f what you're saying. Stop spending your money on weed. Go hop on a plane. Stop pointing the finger and start taking some of the blame. Let me put you on game. Control your emotions. Most of the time, it's really not worth it. Don't be ashamed and beat yourself up for not being perfect.